This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Lyons, Naperville, Illinois. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 14, Chapter 41. in which the captive still continues his adventures. Before fifteen days were over, our renegade had already purchased an excellent vessel with room for more than thirty persons, and to make the transaction safe and lend a color to it, he thought it well to make, as he did, a voyage to a place called Cherchel, twenty leagues from Algiers, on the Oran side, where there is an extensive trade in dried figs. Two or three times he made this voyage in company with the Tagarin already mentioned. The Moors of Aragon are called Tagarins in Barbary, and those of Granada Mudahyars, but in the kingdom of Fez they call the Mudahyars Elkes, and they are the people the king chiefly employs in war. To proceed, every time he passed with his vessel, he anchored in a cove that was not two crossbow shots from the garden where Zoreda was waiting. And there the renegade, together with two Moorish lads that rode, used purposely to station himself either going through his prayers or else practicing as a part of what he meant to perform in earnest. And thus he would go to Zoreda's garden and ask for fruit, which her father gave him, not knowing him. But though, as he afterward told me, he sought to speak to Zoreda, to tell her who he was, and that by my orders he was to take her to the land of the Christians, so that she might feel satisfied and easy. He had never been able to do so, for the Moorish women do not allow themselves to be seen by any Moor or Turk unless their husband or father bid them. With Christian captives they permit freedom of intercourse and communication, even more that, than might be considered proper. But for my part I should have been sorry if he had spoken to her, for perhaps it might have alarmed her to find her affairs talked of by renegades. But God, who ordered it otherwise, afforded no opportunity for our renegade's well-meant purpose, and he, seeing how safely he could go to Cherchel and return, and anchor when and how and where he liked, and that the Tagarin, his partner, had no will but his, and that now I was ransomed, all we wanted was to find some Christians to row, told me to look out for any I should be willing to take with me, over and above those who had been ransomed, and to engage them for the next Friday which he fixed upon for our departure. On this I spoke to twelve Spaniards, all stout rowers, and such as could most easily leave the city. But it was no easy matter to find so many just then, because there were twenty ships out on a cruise, and they had taken all the rowers with them, and these would not have been found were it not that their master remained at home that summer without going to sea, in order to finish a galliot that he had upon the stocks. To these men I said nothing more than that the next Friday in the evening they were to come out stealthily one by one and hang about Haji Murato's garden, waiting for me there until I came. These directions I gave each one separately, with orders that if they saw any other Christians there, they were not to say anything to them except that I had directed them to wait at that spot. This preliminary having been settled, another still more necessary step had to be taken, 
which was to let Zoraida know how matters stood, that she might be prepared and forewarned, so as not to be taken by surprise if we were suddenly to seize upon her before she thought the Christian's vessels could have returned. I determined, therefore, to go to the garden and try if I could speak to her, and the day before my departure I went there under the pretense of gathering herbs. The first person I met was her father, who addressed me in the language that all over Barbary, and even in Constantinople, is the medium between captives and Moors, and is neither Morisco nor Castilian, nor of any other nation, but a mixture of all languages, by means of which we can all understand one another. In this sort of language, I say, he asked me what I wanted in his garden, and to whom I belonged. I replied that I was a slave of the Arno Mami, for I knew as a certainty that he was a very great friend of his, and that I wanted some herbs to make a salad. He asked me then whether I were on ransom or not, and what my master demanded for me. While these questions and answers were proceeding, the fair Zoraida, who had already perceived me some time before, came out of the house in the garden, and as Moorish women are by no means particular about letting themselves be seen by Christians, or, as I have said before, at all coy, she had no hesitation in coming to where her father stood with me. Moreover, her father, seeing her approach slowly, called her to come. It would be beyond my power now to describe to you the great beauty, the high-bred air, the brilliant attire of my beloved Zoraida, as she presented herself before my eyes. I will content myself with saying that more pearls hung from her fair neck, her ears, and her hair than she had hairs on her head. On her ankles, which, as is customary, were bare, she had carsages, for so bracelets or anklets are called in Morisco, of the purest gold set with so many diamonds that she told me afterwards her father valued them at ten thousand doubloons, and those she had on her wrists were worth as much more. The pearls were in profusion and very fine, for the highest display and adornment of the Moorish women is decking themselves with rich pearls and seed pearls and of these there are therefore more among the Moors than among any other people. Zoraida's father had to the reputation of possessing a great number, and the purest in all Algiers, and of possessing also more than two hundred thousand Spanish crowns, and she, who is now mistress of me only, was mistress of all this. Whether thus adorned she would have been beautiful or not, and what she must have been in her prosperity, may be imagined from the beauty remaining to her after so many hardships. For, as every one knows, the beauty of some women has its times and its seasons, and is increased or diminished by chance causes, and naturally the emotions of the mind will heighten or impair it though indeed more frequently they totally destroy it. In a word, she presented herself before me that day attired with the utmost splendor and supremely beautiful. At any rate, she seemed to me the most beautiful object I had ever seen, and when besides I thought of all I owed to her, I felt as though I had before me some heavenly being come to earth to bring me relief and happiness. As she approached, her father told her in his own language that I was a captive belonging to his friend, the Arno Mami, and that I had come for salad. She took up the conversation, and in that mixture of tongues I have spoken of, she asked me if I was a gentleman 
and why I was not ransomed. I answered that I was already ransomed, and that by the price it might be seen what value my master set on me, as I had given one thousand five hundred zoltanis for me. To which she replied, Hadst thou been my father's, I can tell thee I would not have let him part with thee for twice as much, for you Christians always tell lies about yourself, and make yourselves out poor to cheat the Moors. That may be, lady, said I, but indeed I dealt truthfully with my master, as I do and mean to do with everybody in the world. And when dost thou go? said Zoraida. Tomorrow, I think, said I, for there is a vessel here from France which sails tomorrow, and I think I shall go in her. Would it not be better, said Zoraida, to wait for the arrival of ships from Spain and go with them, and not with the French, who are not your friends? No, said I, though if there were intelligence that a vessel were now coming from Spain, it is true I might, perhaps, wait for it. However, it is more likely I shall depart to-morrow, for the longing I feel to return to my country and to those I love is so great that it will not allow me to wait for another opportunity, however more convenient, if it be delayed. No doubt thou art married in thine own country, said Zoraida and for that reason thou art anxious to go and see thy wife. I am not married, I replied, but I have given my promise to marry on my arrival there. And is the lady beautiful to whom thou hast given it? said Zoraida. So beautiful, said I, that to describe her worthily and tell thee the truth, she is very like thee. At this her father laughed very heartily, and said, By Allah, Christian, she must be very beautiful, if she is like my daughter, who is the most beautiful woman in all this kingdom. Only look at her well, and thou wilt see I am telling the truth. Zoraida's father, as the better linguist, helped to interpret most of these words and phrases, for though she spoke the bastard language that, as I have said, is employed there, she expressed her meaning more by signs than by words. While we were still engaged in this conversation, a moor came running up, exclaiming that four Turks had leaped over the fence or wall of the garden, and were gathering the fruit, though it was not yet ripe. The old man was alarmed, and Zoraida too, for the Moors commonly, and so to speak, instinctively, have a dread of the Turks, but particularly of the soldiers, who are so insolent and domineering to the Moors who are under their power that they treat them worse than if they were their slaves. Her father said to Zoraida, Daughter, Retire into the house, and shut thyself in, while I go and speak to these dogs. And thou, Christian, pick thy herbs, and go in peace, and Allah bring thee safe to thy own country. I bowed, and he went away to look for the Turks, leaving me alone with Zoraida, who made as if she were about to retire as her father bade her. But the moment he was concealed by the trees of the garden, Turning to me with her eyes full of tears, she said, Tamiji, Cristiano, Tamiji, that is to say, Art thou going, Christian? Art thou going? I made answer, Yes, lady, but not without thee. Come what may, be on the watch for me on the next Juma, and be not alarmed when thou seest us, for most surely we shall go to the land of the Christians. This I said in such a way that she understood perfectly all that passed between us, and throwing her arm round my neck, she began with feeble steps to move towards the house. But as fate would have it, and it might have been very unfortunate if heaven had not otherwise ordered it, just as we were moving on in the manner and position I have described, 
with her arm round my neck, her father, as he returned after having sent away the Turks, saw how we were walking, and we perceived that he saw us. But Zoraida, ready and quick-witted, took care not to remove her arm from my neck, but on the contrary drew closer to me, and laid her head on my breast, bending her knees a little, and showing all the signs and tokens of fainting, while I at the same time made it seem as though I were supporting her against my will. Her father came running up to where we were, and seeing his daughter in this state, asked what was the matter with her. She, however, giving no answer, he said, no doubt she has fainted in alarm at the entrance of those dogs and taking her from mine, he drew her to his own breast, while she, sighing, her eyes still wet with tears, said again, Amigi, Cristiano, Amigi, go, Christian, go. To this her father replied, There is no need, daughter, for the Christian to go, for he has done thee no harm, and the Turks have now gone. Feel no alarm, there is nothing to hurt thee. For, as I say, the Turks at my request have gone back the way they came. It was they who terrified her, as thou hast said, Senor, said I to her father. But since she tells me to go, I have no wish to displease her. Peace be with thee, and with thy leave I will come back to this garden for herbs, if need be. For my master says there are nowhere better herbs for salad than here. Come back for any thou hast need of, replied Haji Murato, for my daughter does not speak thus because she is displeased with thee or any Christian. She only meant that the Turks should go, not thou, or that it was time for thee to look for thy herbs. With this I at once took my leave of both, and she, looking as though her heart were breaking, retired with her father. While pretending to look for herbs, I made the round of the garden at my ease and studied carefully all the approaches and outlets, and the fastenings of the house, and everything that could be taken advantage of to make our task easy. Having done so, I went and gave an account of all that had taken place to the renegade and my comrades, and looking forward with impatience to the hour when, all fear at an end, I should find myself in possession of the prize which fortune held out to me in the fair and lovely Zoraida. The time passed at length, and the appointed day we so longed for arrived, and all following out the arrangement and plan which, after careful consideration and many a long discussion we had de decided upon, we succeeded as fully as we could have wished for on the Friday following the day upon which I spoke to Zoraida in the garden, the renegade anchored his vessel at nightfall, almost opposite the spot where she was. The Christians who were to row were ready and in hiding in different places round about, all waiting for me, anxious and elated, and eager to attack the vessel they had before their eyes, for they did not know the renegade's plan but expected that they were to gain their liberty by force of arms and by killing the Moors who were on board the vessel. As soon, then, as I and my comrades made our appearance, all those that were in hiding, seeing us, came and joined us. It was now the time when the city gates are shut, and there was no one to be seen in all the space outside. When we were collected together, we debated whether it would be better first to go for Sarida or to make prisoners of the Moorish rowers who first rowed in the vessel. But while we were still uncertain, our renegade came up asking us what kept us, as it was now the time, and all the Moors were off their guard, and most of them asleep. We told him why we hesitated but he said it was of more importance first to secure the vessel, which could be done with the greatest ease and without any danger, 
and then we could go for Zoraida. We all approved of what he said, and so without further delay, guided by him, we made for the vessel. And he, leaping on board first, drew his cutlass and said in Morisco, Let no one stir from this if he does not want it to cost him his life. By this almost all the Christians were on board, and the Moors, who were faint-hearted, hearing their captain speak in this way, were cowed, and without any one of them taking up his arms, indeed they had few or hardly any, they submitted without saying a word to be bound by the Christians, who quickly secured them, threatening them that if they raised any kind of outcry they would all be put to the sword. This having been accomplished, and half of our party being left to keep guard over them, the rest of us, again taking the renegade as our guide, hastened towards Haji Murato's garden, and as good luck would have it, on trying the gate it opened as easily as if it had not been locked, and so, quite quietly and in silence, we reached the house without being perceived by anybody. The lovely Zoraida was watching for us at a window, and as soon as she perceived that there were people there, she asked in a low voice if we were Nizarani, as much as to say or ask if we were Christians. I answered that we were, and begged her to come down. As soon as she recognized me, she did not delay an instant, but without answering a word came down immediately and opened the door and presented herself before us all, so beautiful and so richly attired that I cannot attempt to describe her. The moment I saw her I took her hand and kissed it, and the renegade and my two comrades did the same, and the rest, who knew nothing of the circumstances, did as they saw us do, for it only seemed as if we were returning thanks to her and recognizing her as the giver of our liberty. The renegade asked her in the Morisco language if her father was in the house. She replied that he was and that he was asleep. Then it will be necessary to waken him and take him with us, said the renegade, and everything of value in this fair mansion. Nay, said she, my father must not on any account be touched, and there is nothing in the house except what I shall take, and that will be quite enough to enrich and satisfy all of you. Wait a little, and you shall see. And so saying, she went in, telling us she would return immediately, and bidding us keep quiet, making any noise. I asked the renegade what had passed between them, and when he told me, I declared that nothing should be done except in accordance with the wishes of Zoraida, who now came back with a little trunk so full of gold crowns that she could scarcely carry it. Unfortunately, her father awoke while this was going on, and hearing a noise in the garden, came to the window, and at once perceiving that all those who were there were Christians, Raising a prodigiously loud outcry, he began to call out in Arabic, Christians, Christians, thieves, thieves, by which cries we were all thrown into the greatest fear and embarrassment. But this, the renegade, seeing the danger we were in and how important it was for him to effect his purpose before we were heard, mounted with the utmost quickness to where Haji Morato was and with him went some of our party. I, however, did not dare leave Zoraida, who had fallen almost fainting in my arms. To be brief, those who had gone upstairs acted so promptly that in an instant they came down, carrying Haji Morato with his hands bound and a napkin tied over his mouth, which prevented him from uttering a word, warning him at the same time that to attempt to speak would cost him his life. When his daughter caught sight of him, she covered her eyes so as not to see him, 
and her father was horror-stricken, not knowing how willingly she had placed herself in our hands. But it was now most essential for us to be on the move, and carefully and quickly we regained the vessel, where those who had remained on board were waiting for us in apprehension of some mishap having befallen us. It was barely two hours after night set in when we were all on board the vessel, where the cords were removed from the hands of Zoraida's father, and the napkin from his mouth. But the renegade once more told him not to utter a word or they would take his life. He, when he saw his daughter there, began to sigh piteously, and still more when he perceived that I held her co closely embraced, and that she lay quiet without resisting or complaining, or showing any reluctance. Nevertheless, he remained silent, lest they should carry into effect the repeated threats the renegade had addressed to him. Finding herself now on board, and that we were about to give way with the oars, Zoraida, seeing her father there, and the other moors bound, bade the renegade ask me to do her the favor of releasing the moors and setting her father at liberty for she would rather drown herself in the sea than suffer a father that had loved her so dearly to be carried away captive before her eyes and on her account. The renegade repeated this to me, and I replied that I was very willing to do so, but he replied that it was not advisable, because if they were left there they would at once raise the country and stir up the city and lead to the dispatch of swift cruisers in pursuit and our being taken by land or sea without any possibility of escape, and that all that could be done was to set them free on the first Christian ground we reached. On this point we all agreed, and Zoraida, to whom it was explained, together with the reasons likewise, and then in glad silence and with cheerful alacrity each of our hearts we began to shape our course for the island of majorca the nearest christian land owing however to the tramontana rising a little and the sea growing somewhat rough it was impossible for us to keep a straight course for majorca and we were compelled to coast in the direction of oran not without great uneasiness on our part, lest we should be observed from the town of Shershal, which lies on that coast, not more than sixty miles from Algiers. Moreover, we were afraid of meeting on that course one of the galliots that usually come with goods from Tetuan, although each of us for himself and all of us together felt confident that, if we were to meet a merchant galliot, so that it were not a cruiser, not only should we not be lost, but that we should take a vessel in which we could more safely accomplish our voyage. As we pursued our course, Zoraida kept her head between my hands so as not to see her father and I felt that she would, was praying to Lila Marian to help us. We might have made about thirty miles when daybreak found us some three musket shots off the land, which seemed to us deserted, and with, without anyone to see us. For all that, however, by hard rowing we put out a little to sea, for it was now somewhat calmer, and having gained about two leagues, the word was given to row by batches, while we ate something, for the vessel was well provided, but the rowers said it was not a time to take any rest. Let food be served out to those who were not rowing, but they would not leave their oars on any account. This was done, but now a stiff breeze began to blow, which obliged us to leave off rowing and to make sail at once and steer for Oran, as it was impossible to make any other course. All this was done very promptly, and under sail we ran more than eight miles an hour without any fear, except that of coming across some vessel out on a ro roving expedition. We gave the Moorish rowers some food, 
and the renegade comforted them by telling them that they were not held as captives, as we should set them free on the first opportunity. The same was said to Zoraida's father, who replied, Anything else, Christian, I might hope for or think likely from your generosity and good behavior. But do not think me so simple as to imagine you will give me my liberty, for you would never have exposed yourself to the danger of depriving me of it only to restore it to me so generously, especially as you know who I am and the sum you may expect to receive on restoring it. And if you will only name that, I here offer you all you require for myself and for my unhappy daughter there or else for her alone, for she is the greatest and most precious part of my soul. As he said this, he began to weep so bitterly that he filled us all with compassion and forced Zoraida to look at him, and when she saw him weeping, she was so moved that she rose from my feet and ran to throw her arms round him, and pressing her face to his, they both gave way to such an outburst of tears that several of us were constrained to keep them company. But when her father saw her in full dress and with all her jewels about her, he said to her in his own language, What means this, my daughter? Last night, before this terrible misfortune in which we are plunged befell us, I saw thee in thy every day and indoor garments and now without having had time to attire thyself and without my bringing thee any joyful tidings to furnish an occasion for adorning and bedecking, bedecking thyself i see thee arrayed in the finest attire it would be in my power to give thee when fortune was most kind to us answer me this for it causes me greater anxiety and surprise than even this misfortune itself the renegade interpreted to us what the moor said to his daughter she however returned him no answer but when he observed in one corner of the vessel the little trunk in which she used to keep her jewels which he well knew he had left in algiers and had not brought to the garden he was still more amazed and asked her how that trunk had come into our hands and what there was in it to which the renegade without waiting for zoraida to reply made answer do not trouble thyself by asking thy daughter zoraida so many questions senor for the one answer i will give thee will serve for all i would have thee know that she is a christian and that it is she who has been the file for our chains and our deliverer from captivity she is here of her own free will, as glad, I imagine, to find herself in this position as he who escapes from darkness into light, from death to life, from suffering to glory. "'Daughter, is this true, what he says?' cried the moor. "'It is,' replied Zoraida. "'That thou art in truth a Christian?' said the old man and that thou hast given thy father into the power of his enemies? To which Zoraida made answer, A Christian I am, but it is not I who have placed thee in this position, for it never was my wish to leave thee or do thee harm, but only to do good to myself. And what good hast thou done thyself, daughter? said he ask thou that said she of lila marianne for she can tell thee better than i the moor had hardly heard these words when with marvellous quickness he flung himself head foremost into the sea where no doubt he would have been drowned had not the long and full dress he wore held him up for a little on the surface of the water Zoraida cried aloud to us to save him, and we were all hastened to help, and seizing him by his robe, we drew him in half-drowned and insensible, at which Zoraida was in such distress 
that she wept over him as piteously and bitterly as though he were already dead. We turned him upon his face, and he voided a great quantity of water, and at the end of two hours came to himself. Meanwhile, the wind having changed, we were compelled to head for the land and ply our oars to avoid being driven on shore. But it was our good fortune to reach a creek that lies on one side of a small promontory or cape, called by the Moors that of the Kavarumia, which in our language means the wicked Christian woman. For it is a tradition among them that La Cava, through which Spain was lost, lies buried at that spot, Cava in their language meaning wicked woman, and Rumia Christian. Moreover, they count it unlucky to anchor there when necessity compels them, and they never do so otherwise. For us, however, it was not the resting place of the wicked woman, but a haven of safety for our relief, so much had the sea now got up. We posted a lookout on shore, and never let the oars out of our hands, and ate of the stores the renegade had laid in, imploring God and Our Lady with all our hearts to help and protect us, that we might give a happy ending to a beginning so prosperous. At the entreaty of Zoraida, orders were given to set on shore her father and the other moors who were still bound, for she could not endure nor could her tender heart bear to see her father in bonds and her fellow-countrymen prisoners before her eyes. We promised her to do this at the moment of departure, for as it was uninhabited we ran no risk in releasing them that place. Our prayers were not so far in vain as to be unheard by heaven for after a while the wind changed in our favor and made the sea calm, inviting us once more to resume our voyage with a good heart. Seeing this, we unbound the moors, and one by one put them on shore, at which they were filled with amazement. But when we came to land Zor Zoraida's father, who had now completely recovered his senses, he said, Why is it, think ye, Christians? that this wicked woman is rejoiced at your giving me my liberty. Think ye it is because of the affection she bears me? Nay, verily, it is only because of the hindrance my presence offers to the execution of her base designs. And think not that it is her belief that yours is better than ours, and that has led her to change her religion." It is only because she knows that immodesty is more freely practiced in your country than in ours. Then turning to Zoraida, while I and another of the Christians held him fast by both arms, lest he should do some mad act, he said to her, Infamous girl, misguided maiden, whether in thy blindness and madness art thou going in the hands of these dogs, our natural enemies? Cursed be the hour when I begot thee, cursed the luxury and indulgence in which I reared thee. But seeing that he was not likely soon to cease, I made haste to put him on shore, and thence he continued his maledictions and lamentations aloud, calling on Mohammed to pray to Allah to destroy us, to confound us, to make an end of us, and when, in consequence of having made sail, we could no longer hear what he said, we could see what he did, how he plucked out his beard and tore his hair and lay writhing on the ground. But once he raised his voice to such a pitch that we were able to hear what he said, come back dear daughter come back to shore i forgive thee all let those men have the money for it is theirs now and come back to comfort thy sorrowing father who will yield up his life on this barren strand if thou dost leave him all this zoraida heard and heard with sorrow and tears and all she could say in answer was allah grant that leila marianne who has made me become a Christian, give thee comfort in thy sorrow, my father. 
Allah knows that I could not do otherwise than I have done, and that these Christians owe nothing to my will, for even had I wished not to accompany them, but remain at home, it would have been impossible for me, so eagerly did my soul urge me on to the accomplishment of this purpose, which I feel to be as righteous as to thee, dear father, it seems wicked. But neither could her father hear her, nor we see him when she said this. And so, while I consoled Zoraida, we turned our attention to our voyage, in which a breeze from the right point so favoured us that we made sure of finding ourselves off the coast of Spain on the morrow by daybreak. But, as good seldom or never comes pure and unmixed, without being attended or followed by some disturbing evil that gives a shock to it, our fortune, or perhaps the curses which the moor had hurled at his daughter, for whatever kind of father they may come from, these are always to be dreaded, brought it about that when we were now in mid-sea, and the night about three hours spent, as we were running with all sails set and oars lashed, for the favouring breeze saved us the trouble of using them, we saw by the light of the moon, which shone brilliantly, a square-rigged vessel in full sail close to us, luffing up and standing across our course, and so close that we had to strike sail to avoid running foul of her, while they too put the helm hard up to let us pass. They came to the side of the ship to ask who we were, whither we were bound, and whence we came. But as they asked this in French, our renegade said, Let no one answer, for no doubt these are French corsairs who plunder all comers. Acting on this warning, no one answered a word, but after we had gone a little ahead, and the vessel was now lying to leeward, suddenly they fired two guns, and apparently both loaded with chain-shot, for with one they cut our mast in half and brought down both it and the sail into the sea, and the other, discharged at the same moment, sent a ball into our vessel amidship, staving her in completely, but without doing any further damage. We, however, finding ourselves sinking, began to shout for help, and call upon those in the ship to pick us up as we were beginning to fill. Then they lay to, and lowering a skiff or boat, as many as a dozen Frenchmen, well armed with matchlocks, and all their matches burning, got into it and came alongside, and seeing how few we were, and that our vessel was going down, they took us in telling us that this had come to us through our incivility in not giving them an answer. Our renegade took the trunk containing Zoraida's wealth and dropped it into the sea without any one perceiving what he did. In short, we went on board with a Frenchman, who, after having ascertained all they wanted to know about us, rifled us of everything we had as if they had been our bitterest enemies, and from Zoraida they took even the anklets she wore on her feet, but the distress they caused her did not distress me so much as the fear that I was in that from robbing her of her rich and precious jewels they would proceed to rob her of the most precious jewel that she valued more than all. The desires, however, of those people do not go beyond money, but of that their covetousness is insatiable, and on this occasion it was carried to such a pitch that they would have taken even the clothes we wore as captives if they had been worth anything to them. It was the advice of some of them to throw us all into the sea wrapped up in a sail, for their purpose was to trade at some of the ports of Spain giving themselves out as Bretons, and if they brought us alive they would be punished as soon as the robbery was discovered. But the captain, who was the one who had plundered my beloved Zoraida, said he was satisfied with the prize he had got, and that he would not touch at any Spanish port, 
but passed the straits of gibraltar by night or as best he could and make for la rochelle from which he had sailed so they agreed by common consent to give us the skiff belonging to their ship and all we required for the short voyage that remained to us and this they did the next day on coming in sight of the spanish coast with which and the joy we felt all our sufferings and miseries were as completely forgotten as if they had never been endured by us such is the delight of recovering lost liberty it may have been about midday when they placed us in the boat giving us two kegs of water and some biscuit and the captain moved by i know not what compassion as the lovely zoraida was about to embark gave her some forty gold crowns and would not permit his men to take from her those same garments which she has on now we got into the boat returning them thanks for their kindness to us and showing ourselves grateful rather than indignant they stood out to sea steering for the straits we without looking to any compass save the land we had before us set ourselves to the row with such energy that by sunset we were so near that we might easily we thought land before the night was far advanced but as the moon did not show that night and the sky was clouded and as we knew not whereabouts we were it did not seem to us a prudent thing to make for the shore as several of us advised saying we ought to run ourselves ashore even if it were on rocks and far from any habitation for in this way we should be relieved from the apprehensions we naturally felt of the prowling vessels of the tetuan corsairs who leave barbary at nightfall and are on the spanish coast by daybreak where they commonly take some prize and then go home to sleep in their own houses but of the conflicting counsels the one which was adopted was that we should approach gradually and land where we could if the sea were calm enough to permit us this was done and a little before midnight we drew near to the foot of a huge and lofty mountain not so close to the sea but that it left a narrow space on which to land conveniently we ran our boat up on the sand and all sprang out and kissed the ground and with tears of joyful satisfaction returned thanks to god our lord for all his incomparable goodness to us on our voyage we took out of the boat the provisions it contained and drew it up on the shore and then climbed a long way up the mountain for even there we could not feel easy in our hearts or persuade ourselves that it was the christian soil that was now under our feet the dawn came more slowly i think than we could have wished we completed the ascent in order to see if from the summit any habitation or any shepherd's huts could be discovered but strain our eyes as we might neither dwelling nor human being nor path nor road could we perceive however we determined to push on farther as it could not but be that ere long we must see some one who could tell us where we were but what distressed me most was to see zoraida going on foot over that rough ground for though i once carried her on my shoulders she was more wearied by my weariness than rested by the rest and so she would never again allow me to undergo the exertion and went on very patiently and cheerfully while i led her by the hand we had gone rather less than a quarter of a league when the sound of a little bell fell on our ears a clear proof that there were flocks hard by and looking about carefully to see if any were within view we observed a young shepherd tranquilly and unsuspiciously trimming a stick with his knife at the foot of a cork tree we called to him and he raising his head sprang nimbly to his feet for as we afterwards learned the first who presented themselves to his sight were the renegade and zoraida and seeing them in moorish dress 
he imagined that all the moors of Barbary were upon him, and plunging with marvellous swiftness into the thicket in front of him, he began to raise a prodigious outcry, exclaiming, "'The moors, the moors have landed to arms, to arms!' We were all thrown into perplexity by these cries, not knowing what to do, but reflecting that the shouts of the shepherd would raise the country, and that the mounted coast guard would come at once to see what was the matter. We agreed that the renegade must strip off his Turkish garments and put on a captive's jacket or coat, which one of our party gave him at once, though he himself was reduced to his shirt, and so commending ourselves to God, we followed the same road which we saw the shepherd take, expecting every moment that the coast guard would be down upon us. Nor did our expectation deceive us, for two hours had not passed when, coming out of the brushwood into the open ground, we perceived some fifty mounted men swiftly approach, approaching us at a hand gallop. As soon as we saw them we stood, stood still, waiting for them, but as they came close, and instead of the moors they were in quest of, we saw a set of poor Christians. They were taken aback, and one of them asked if it could be we who were the cause of the shepherd having raised the call to arms. I said yes, and as I was about to explain to him what had occurred, and whence we came, and who we were, one of the Christians of our party recognized the horseman who had put the question to us, and before I could say anything more he exclaimed, "'Thanks be to God, sirs, for bringing us to such good quarters, for, if I do not deceive myself, the ground we stand on is that of Velez Malaga, unless, indeed, all my years of captivity have made me unable to recollect that you, senor, who ask who we are, are Pedro de Bustamante, my uncle. The Christian captive had hardly uttered these words when the horseman threw himself off his horse and ran to embrace the young man, crying, Nephew of my soul and life, I recognize thee now, and long have I mourned thee as dead, I and my sister, thy mother, and all thy kin that are still alive, and whom God has been pleased to preserve, that they may enjoy the happiness of seeing thee. We knew long since that thou wert in Algiers, and from the appearance of thy garments and those of all this company I conclude that ye have had a miraculous restoration to liberty. It is true, replied the young man, and by and by we will tell you all. As soon as the horsemen understood that we were Christian captives, they dismounted from their horses and each offered his to carry us to the city of Velez Malaga which was a league and a half distant. Some of them went to bring the boat to the city, we having told them where we had left it. Others took us up behind them, and Zoraida was placed on the horse of the young man's uncle. The whole town came out to meet us, for they had by this time heard of our arrival from one who had gone on in advance. They were not astonished to see liberated captives or captive moors, for people on that coast are well used to see both one and the other, but they were astonished at the beauty of Zoraida, which was just then heightened, as well by the exertion of travelling as by the joy of finding herself on Christian soil, and relieved of all fear of being lost. For this had brought such a glow upon her face, that unless my affection for her were deceiving me, I would venture to say that there was not a more beautiful creature in the world, at least that I had ever seen. We went straight to the church to return thanks to God for the mercies we had received, and when Zoraida entered it she said there were faces there like Lila Marian's. We told her they were her images and as well as he could the renegade explained to her what they meant, that she might adore them as if each of them were the very same Lela Marian 
that she had that had spoken to her and she having great intelligence and a quick and clear instinct understood at once all he said to her about them thence they took us away and distributed us all in different houses in the town but as for the renegade zoraida and myself the christian who came with us brought us to the house of his parents who had a fair share of the gifts of fortune and treated us with as much kindness as they did their own son we remained six days in velez at the end of which the renegade having informed himself of all that was requisite for him to do set out for the city of granada to restore himself to the sacred bosom of the church through the medium of the holy inquisition the other released captives took their departures each the way that seemed best to him and zoraida and i were left alone with nothing more than the crowns which the courtesy of the frenchman had bestowed upon zoraida out of which i bought the beast on which she rides and i for the present attending her as her father and squire and not as her husband we are now going to ascertain if my father is living or if any of my brothers has had better fortune than mine has been though as heaven has made me the companion of zoraida i think no other lot could be assigned to me however happy that i would rather have the patience with which she endures the hardship that poverty brings with it and the eagerness she shows to become a christian are such that they fill me with admiration and bind me to serve her all my life though the happiness i feel in seeing myself hers and her mine is disturbed and marred by not knowing whether i shall find any corner to shelter her in my own country or whether time and death may not have made such changes in the fortunes and lives of my father and brothers that i shall hardly find any one who knows me if they are not alive i have no more of my story to tell you gentlemen whether it be an interesting or a curious one let your better judgments decide all i can say is i would gladly have told it to you more briefly although my fear of weir wearying you has made me leave out more than one circumstance end of chapter 41is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 15. Chapters 42 and 43. Chapter 42 which treats of what further took place in the inn, and of several other things worth knowing. With these words the captive held his peace, and Don Fernando said to him, In truth, Captain, the manner in which you have related this remarkable adventure has been such as befitted the novelty and strangeness of the matter. The whole story is curious and uncommon, and abounds with incidents that fill the hearers with wonder and astonishment and so great is the pleasure we have found in listening to it, that we should be glad if it were to begin again, even though to-morrow were to find us still occupied with the same tale. And while he said this, Cardenio and the rest of them offered to be of service to him in any way that lay in their power, and in words and language so kindly and sincere, that the captain was much gratified by their good will. In particular, Don Fernando offered, if he would go back with him, to get his brother the Marquis to become godfather at the baptism of Zoraida, and on his own part to provide him with the means of making his appearance in his own country with the credit and comfort he was entitled to. For all this the captive returned thanks very courteously, although he would not accept any of their generous offers. 
By this time night closed in, and as it did, there came up to the inn a coach attended by some men on horseback, who demanded accommodation, to which the landlady replied, that there was not a hand's breadth of the whole inn unoccupied. Still, for all that, said one of those who had entered on horseback, room must be found for his lordship the judge here. At this name the landlady was taken aback, and said, Seigneur, the fact is I have no beds, but if his lordship the judge carries one with him, as no doubt he does, let him come in and welcome, for my husband and I will give up our room to accommodate his worship. Very good, so be it, said the squire. But in the meantime a man had got out of the coach, whose dress indicated at a glance the office and post he held. For the long robe, with ruffled sleeves that he wore, showed that he was, as his servant said, a judge of appeal. He led by the hand a young girl in a travelling dress, apparently about sixteen years of age, and of such a high-bred air, so beautiful and so graceful, that all were filled with admiration when she made her appearance. And but for having seen Dorothea, Lucinda, and Zoraida, who were there in the inn, they would have fancied that a beauty like that of this maiden's would have been hard to find. Don Quixote was present at the entrance of the judge with the young lady, and as soon as he saw him he said, "'Your worship may with confidence enter and take your ease in this castle, for though the accommodation be scanty and poor, there are no quarters so cramped or inconvenient that they cannot make room for arms and letters. Above all, if arms and letters have beauty for a guide and leader, as letters represented by your worship have in this fair maiden,' to whom not only ought castles to throw themselves open and yield themselves up, but rocks should rend themselves asunder, and mountains divide and bow themselves down, to give her a reception. Enter your worship, I say, into this paradise, for here you will find stars and suns to accompany the heaven your worship brings with you. Here you will find arms in their supreme excellence, and beauty in its highest perfection. The judge was struck with amazement at the language of Don Quixote, whom he scrutinized very carefully, no less astonished by his figure than by his talk. And before he could find words to answer him, he had a fresh surprise, when he saw opposite to him Lucinda, Dorothea, and Zoraida, who, having heard of the new guests and of the beauty of the young lady, had come to see her and welcome her. Don Fernando, Cardinio, and the curate, however, greeted him with a more intelligible and polished style. In short, the judge made his entrance in a state of bewilderment, as well with what he saw as what he heard, and the fair ladies of the inn gave the fair damsel a cordial welcome. On the whole he could perceive that all who were there were people of quality, but with the figure, countenance, and bearing of Don Quixote, he was at his wit's end, and all civilities having been exchanged, and the accommodation of the inn inquired into, it was settled, as it had been before settled, that all the women should retire to the garret that had already been mentioned, and that the men should remain outside as if to guard them. The judge, therefore, was very well pleased to allow his daughter, for such the damsel was, to go with the ladies, which she did very willingly, and with part of the host's narrow bed, and half of what the judge had brought with him, they made a more comfortable arrangement for the night than they had expected. The captive, whose heart had leaped within him the instant he saw the judge, telling him somehow that this was his brother, asked one of the servants who accompanied him what his name was, and whether he knew from what part of the country he came. The servant replied that he was called the licentiate Juan Perez de Viedma, and that he had heard it said he came from a village in the mountains of Leon. From this statement, and what he himself had seen, he felt convinced that this was his brother, who had adopted his letters by his father's advice. And excited and rejoiced, he called Don Fernando and Cardinio and the curate aside, 
and told them how the matter stood, assuring them that the judge was his brother. The servant had further informed him that he was now going to the Indies, with the appointment of judge of the Supreme Court of Mexico, and he had learned likewise that the young lady was his daughter, whose mother had died in giving birth to her, and that he was very rich in consequence of the dowry left to him with the daughter. He asked their advice as to what means he should adopt to make himself known, or to ascertain beforehand whether, when he had made himself known, his brother, seeing him so poor, would be ashamed of him, or would receive him with a warm heart. "'Leave it to me to find out that,' said the curate. "'Though there is no reason for supposing, Senor Capitan, that you will not be kindly received, because the worth and wisdom that your brother's bearing shows him to possess do not make it likely that he would have proved haughty or insensible, or that he would not know how to estimate the accidents of fortune at their proper value.' "'Still,' said the captain, "'I would not make myself known abruptly, "'but in some indirect way.' "'I have told you already,' said the curate, "'that I will manage it in a way to satisfy us all.' "'By the time supper was ready, "'and they all took their seats at the table, "'except the captive and the ladies "'who supped by themselves in their own room, "'in the middle of supper the curate said, "'I heard a comrade of your worship's name, Senor Judge, in Constantinople, "'where I was a captive for several years. "'And that same comrade was one of the stoutest soldiers and captains "'in the whole Spanish infantry. "'But he had as large a share of misfortune as he had of gallantry and courage.' "'And how was the captain called, Senor? asked the judge. "'He was called Roy Perez de Vidme,' replied the curate. "'And he was born in a village in the mountains of Leon.' "'and he mentioned a circumstance connected with his father and his brothers, "'which, had it not been told me by so truthful a man as he was, "'I should have set down as one of those fables "'the old women tell over the fire in winter. "'For he said his father had divided his property among his three sons, "'and had addressed words of advice to them sounder than any of Cato's. "'But I can say this much, "'that the choice he made of going to the wars "'was attended with such success.' that by his gallant conduct and courage, and without any help save his own merit, he rose in a few years to be captain of infantry, and to see himself on the high road, and in position to be given the command of a corps before long. But fortune was against him, for where he might have expected her favour he lost it, and with it his liberty, on that glorious day when so many received theirs, at the Battle of Lepanto, I lost mine at the Galetta, and after a variety of adventures we found ourselves comrades at Constantinople. Thence he went to Algiers, where he met with one of the most extraordinary adventures that ever befell any one in the world. Here the curate went on to relate briefly his brother's adventure with Zoraida, to all which the judge gave such an attentive hearing that he never before had been so much of a hearer. The curate, however, only went so far as to describe how the Frenchman plundered those who were in the boat, and the poverty and distress in which his comrade and the fair moor were left, of whom he said he had not been able to learn what became of them, or whether they had reached Spain, or been carried to France by the Frenchman. The captain, standing a little to one side, was listening to all the curate said, and watching every movement of his brother, who, as soon as he perceived the curate had made an end to his story, gave a deep sigh, and said with his eyes full of tears, "'Oh, Seigneur, if you only knew what news you have given me, and how it comes home to me, making me show I have feel it with these tears that spring from my eyes in spite of all my worldly wisdom and self-restraint. That brave captain that you speak of is my eldest brother, who, being of a bolder and loftier mind than my other brother or myself, "'chose the honourable and worthy calling of arms, "'which was one of the three careers our father proposed to us, "'as your comrade mentioned in that fable you thought he was telling you. "'I followed that of letters, "'in which God and my own excitations have raised me to the position in which you see me. "'My second brother is in Peru, "'so wealthy that with what he has sent to my father and to me, "'he has fully repaid the portion he took with him.' 
and has even furnished my father's hands with the means of gratifying his natural generosity, while I too have been enabled to pursue my studies in a more becoming and creditable fashion, and so to attain my present standing. My father is still alive, though dying with anxiety to hear of his eldest son, and you praise God unceasingly that death may not close his eyes until he has looked upon those of his son. But with regard to him what surprises me is, that having so much common sense as he had, he should have neglected to give any intelligence about himself, either in his troubles and sufferings, or in his prosperity. For if his father or any of us had known of his condition, he need not have waited for that miracle of the reed to obtain his ransom. But what now disquiets me is the uncertainty whether those Frenchmen may have restored him to liberty, or murdered him to hide the robbery. All this will make me continue my journey, not with the satisfaction in which I began it, but in the deepest melancholy and sadness. O oh, dear brother, that I only knew where thou art now, and I would hasten to seek thee out, and deliver thee from thy sufferings, though it were to cost me suffering myself. Oh, that I could bring news to our old father, that thou art alive, even wert thou in the deepest dungeon of Barbary, for his wealth and my brother's and mine would rescue thee thence. O oh, beautiful and generous Oreda, that I could repay thy good goodness to a brother, that I could be present at the new birth of thy soul, and at thy bridal that would give us all such happiness. All this and more the judge uttered with such deep emotion, at the news he had received of his brother, that all who heard him shared in it, showing their sympathy with his sorrow. The curate, seeing then how well he had succeeded in carrying out his purpose, and the captain's wishes, had no desire to keep them unhappy any longer. So he rose from the table, and going to the room where Zoraida was, he took her by the hand, Lucinda, Dorothea, and the judge's daughter following her. The captain was waiting to see what the curate would do, when the latter, taking him with the other hand, advanced with both of them to where the judge and the other gentlemen were, and said, Let your tears cease to flow, Signor Judge, and the wish of your heart be gratified as fully as you could desire, for you have before you your worthy brother and your good sister-in-law. He whom you see here is the Captain Vidme, and this is the fair Moor who has been so good to him. The Frenchmen I told you of have reduced them to the state of poverty you see, that you may show them the generosity of your kind heart. The Captain ran to embrace his brother, who placed both hands on his breast so as to have a good look at him, holding him a little way off, but as soon as he had fully recognised him, he clasped him in his arms so closely shedding such tears of heartfelt joy, that most of those present could not but join in them. The words the brothers exchanged, the emotion they showed, can scarcely be imagined, I fancy, much less put down in writing. They told each other in a few words the events of their lives. They showed the true affection of brothers in all its strength. Then the judge embraced Zoraida putting all he possessed at her disposal. Then he made his daughter embrace her, and the fair Christian and the lovely Moor drew fresh tears from every eye. And there was Don Quixote, observing all these strange proceedings attentively, without uttering a word, and attributing the whole to chimeras of a knightly errantry. Then they agreed that the captain and Zoraida should return with his brother to Seville, and send news to his father of his having been delivered and found, so as to enable him to come and to be present at the marriage and baptism of Zoraida, for it was impossible for the judge to put off his journey, as he was informed that in a month from that time the fleet was to sail from Seville for New Spain, and to miss the passage would have been a great inconvenience to him. In short, everybody was well pleased, and glad at the captive's good fortune. And as now almost two-thirds of the night were passed, they resolved to retire to rest for the remainder of it. Don Quixote offered to mount guard over the castle, lest they should be attacked by some giant, or other malevolent scoundrel, 
covetous of the great treasure of beauty the castle contained. Those who understood him returned him thanks for this service, and they gave the judge an account of his extraordinary humour, with which he was not a little amused. Sancho Panza alone was fuming at the lateness of the hour for retiring to rest, and he, of all, was the one that made himself most comfortable, as he stretched himself on the trappings of his ass, which, as will be told farther on, cost him so dear. The ladies, then having retired to their chamber, and the others having disposed themselves with as little discomfort as they could, Don Quixote sallied out of the inn to act as sentinel of the castle as he had promised. It happened, however, that a little before the approach of dawn, a voice so musical and sweet reached the ears of the ladies that it forced them all to listen attentively. But especially Dorothea, who had been awake, and by whose side Donna Clara de Vadme, for so the judge's daughter was called, lay sleeping. No one could imagine who it was that sang so sweetly, and the voice was unaccompanied by any instrument. At one moment it seemed to them as if the singer were in the courtyard, at another in the stable, and as they were all attention wondering, Cardinio came to the door and said, Listen, whoever is not asleep, and you will hear a muleteer's voice that enchants as it chants. We are listening to it already, Signor, said Dorothea, on which Cardinio went away, and Dorothea, giving all her attention to it, made out the words of the song to be these. Chapter 43 Wherein is related the pleasant story of the muleteer, together with other strange things that come to pass in the inn. Ah, me! Love's mariner am I, on love's deep ocean sailing. I know not where the haven lies, I dare not hope to gain it. One solitary distant star is all I have to guide me, a brighter orb than those of old that Polinarus lighted. And vaguely drifting am I born, I know not where it leads me. I fix my gaze on it alone, of all besides it heedless. But over cautious prudery, and coyness cold and cruel, when most I need it, these, like clouds, its longed-for light refuse me. Bright star, goal of my yearning eyes, as thou above me beamest, when thou shalt hide thee from my sight, I'll know that death is near me. The singer had got so far, when it struck Dorothea, that it was not fair to let Clara miss hearing such a sweet voice. So, shaking her from side to side, she woke her, saying, Forgive me, child, for waking thee. "'but I do so that thou mayest have the pleasure "'of hearing the best voice thou hast ever heard, "'perhaps in all thy life.' "'Clara awoke quite drowsy, "'and not understanding at the moment what Dorothea said, "'asked her what it was. "'She repeated what she had said, "'and Clara became attentive at once. "'But she had hardly heard two lines, "'as the singer continued, "'when a strange trembling seized her, as if she were suffering from a severe attack of quartine ague. And throwing her arms around Dorothea, she said, Ah, dear lady of my soul and my life, why did you wake me? The greatest kindness fortune could do me now would be to close my eyes and ears, so as neither to see or hear that unhappy musician. What are thou talking about, child? said Dorothea. Why, they say this singer is a muleteer. "'Nay, he is the lord of many places,' replied Clara, "'and that one in my heart which he holds so firmly "'shall never be taken from him, unless he be willing to surrender it.' "'Dorothea was amazed at the ardent language of the girl, "'for it seemed to be far beyond such experience of life "'as her tender years gave promise of. "'So she said to her, "'You speak in a way that I cannot understand you, Signor Clara. "'Explain yourself more clearly.' "'and tell me what it is that you are saying about hearts and places, "'and this musician whose voice has so moved you. "'But do not tell me anything now. "'I do not want to lose the pleasure I get from listening to the singer "'by giving my attention to your transports. "'For I perceive he is beginning to sing a new strain and a new air. 
"'Let him, in heaven's name,' returned Clara, "'and not to hear him she stopped both ears with her hands, "'at which Dorothea was again surprised. "'But turning her attention to the song, "'she found that it ran in this fashion. "'Sweet hope, my stay, "'that onward to the goal of thy intent "'dost make thy way. "'Heedless of hindrance or impediment, "'have thou no fear "'if at each step thou findest death is near. "'No victory, no joy of triumph "'dost the faint heart know. "'Unblessed is he that a bold font "'to fortune dares not show. "'But soul and sense "'in bondage yieldeth up to indolence. "'If love he wears do dearly sell, his right must be contest. What gold compares with that whereon his stamp he hath impressed? And all men know what cost is little that we rate but low. Love, resolute, knows not the word impossibility. And though my suit beset by endless obstacles I see, yet no despair shall hold me bound to earth while heaven is there. Here the voice ceased and Clara's sobs began afresh, all which excited Dorothea's curiosity to know what could be the cause of singing so sweet and weeping so bitter. So she again asked her what it was she was going to say before. On this Clara, afraid that Lucinda might overhear her, winding her arms tightly round Dorothea, put her mouth so close to her ear that she could speak without fear of being heard by any one else, and said, this singer, dear Signora, is the son of a gentleman of Aragon, lord of two villages, who lives opposite my father's house at Madrid. And though my father had curtains to the windows of his house in winter, and lattice work in summer, in some way, I know not how, this gentleman, who was pursuing his studies, saw me, whether in church or elsewhere, I cannot tell, and, in fact, fell in love with me and gave me to know it from the window of his house, with so many signs and tears that I was forced to believe him, and even to love him, without knowing what it was he wanted of me. One of the signs he used to make me was to link one hand in the other, to show me he wished to marry me. And though I should have been glad, if that could be, being alone and motherless, I knew not whom to open my mind to, and so I left it as it was showing him no favour, except when my father and his two were from home, to raise the curtain or the lattice a little, and let him see me plainly, at which he would show such delight that he seemed as if he were going mad. Meanwhile the time for my father's departure arrived, which he became aware of, but not from me, for I had never been able to tell him of it. He fell sick, of grief, I believe, and so the day we were going away I could not see him to take farewell of him, were it only with the eyes. But after we had been two days on the road, on entering the posoda of a village a day's journey from this, I saw him at the inn's door, in the dress of a muleteer, and so well disguised that if I did not carry his image graven on my heart it would have been impossible for me to recognise him. But I knew him, and I was surprised, and glad. He watched me, unsuspected by my father, from whom he always hides himself when he crosses my path on the road, or in the Poseidas where we halt. And, as I know what he is, and reflect that for love of me he makes this journey on foot in all this hardship, I am ready to die of sorrow, and where he sets foot there I set my eyes. I know not with what object he has come, or how he could have got away from his father, who loves him beyond measure, having no other heir, and because he deserves it, as you will perceive when you see him. And moreover, I can tell you, all that he sings is out of his own head, for I have heard them say he is a great scholar and poet. And what is more, every time I see him, or hear him sing, I tremble all over, and am terrified lest my father should recognise him and come to know of our loves. I have never spoken a word to him in my life, and for all that I love him, so that I could not live without him. This, dear Signora, is all I have to tell you about the musician, whose voice has delighted you so much. And from it alone you might easily perceive he is no muleteer, 
but a lord of hearts and towns, as I told you already. Say no more, Donna Clara, said Dorothea at this, at the same time kissing her a thousand times over. Say no more, I tell you, but wait till day comes, when I trust in God to arrange this affair of yours, so that it may have the happy ending such an innocent beginning deserves. Ah, Signora, said Donna Clara, what end can be hoped for when his father is of such lofty position, and so wealthy, that he would think I was not fit to be even a servant to his son, much less wife? And as to marrying without the knowledge of my father, I would not do it for all the world. I would not ask anything more than that this youth should go back and leave me, perhaps with not seeing him, and the long distance we shall have to travel. The pain I suffer now may become easier." "'though I dare say the remedy I propose will do me very little good. "'I don't know how the devil this has come about, "'or how this love I have for him got in. "'I, such a young girl, and he such a mere boy, "'for I very believe we are both of an age. "'And I am not sixteen yet, "'for I will be sixteen Michaelmas day next,' my father says. "'Dorothea could not help laughing to hear how like a child Donna Clara spoke. "'Let us go to sleep now, Signora,' said she, "'for the little of the night that I fancy is left to us. "'God will soon send us daylight, and we will set all to rights, "'or it will go hard with me.' "'With this they fell asleep, and deep silence reigned all through the inn. "'The only persons not asleep were the landlady's daughter "'and her servant, Maritornus, "'who, knowing the weak point of Don Quixote's humour, and that he was outside the inn mounting guard in armour and on horseback, resolved, the pair of them, to play some trick upon him, or at any rate to amuse themselves for a while by listening to his nonsense. As it so happened, there was not a window in the whole inn that looked outwards, except a hole in the wall of a straw-loft, through which they used to throw out the straw. At this hole the two demi-damsels posted themselves, and observed Don Quixote on his horse, leaning on his pike, and from time to time sending forth such deep and doleful sighs, that he seemed to pluck up his soul by the roots with each of them, and they could hear him, too, saying in a soft, tender, loving tone, "'O oh, my lady Dulcinea del Toboso, perfection of all beauty, summit and crown of discretion, treasure-house of grace, depository of virtue,' And finally, ideal of all that is good, honourable, and delectable in this world. What is thy grace doing now? Art thou, perchance, mindful of thy enslaved knight, who, of his own free will, hath exposed himself to so great perils, and all to serve thee? Give me tidings of her, O luminary of the three faces. Perhaps, at this moment, envious of hers, thou art regarding her, either as she paces to and fro some gallery of her sumptuous palaces, or leans over some balcony, meditating how, whilst preserving her purity and greatness, she may mitigate the tortures this wretched heart of mine endures for her sake. What glory should recompense my sufferings, what repose my toil, and lastly, what death my life, and what reward my services? And thou, O son, Thou art now doubtless harnessing thy steeds in haste to raise betimes and come forth to see my lady. When thou seest her, I entreat of thee to salute her on my behalf. But have a care, when thou shalt see her and salute her, that thou kiss not her face. For I shall be more jealous of thee than thou wert of that light-footed ingrate that made thee sweat and run so on the plains of Thessaly, or in the banks of the Pennus for I do not exactly recollect where it was thou didst run on that occasion, in thy jealousy and love. Don Quixote had got so far in his pathetic speech, when the landlady's daughter began to signal him, saying, Seigneur, come over here, please. At these signals and voice, Don Quixote turned his head, and saw by the light of the moon, which then was in its full splendour, that someone was calling to him from the hole in the wall which seemed to him to be a window, and what is more, 
with a gilt grating as rich castles, such as he believed the inn to be, ought to have. And it immediately suggested itself to his imagination that, as on the former occasion, the fair damsel, the daughter of the lady of the castle, overcome by love for him, was once more endeavouring to win his affections. And with this idea, not to show himself discourteous, or ungrateful, he turned Rothenanti's head, and approached the hole. And as he perceived the two wenches, he said, "'I pity you, beauteous lady, that you should have directed your thoughts of love to a quarter from whence it is impossible that such a return can be made to you, as is due to your great merit and gentle birth, for which you must not blame this unhappy knight errant, whom love renders incapable of submission to any other than her whom, the first moment his eyes beheld her, he made absolute mistress of his soul. Forgive me, noble lady, and retire to your apartment, and do not, by any further declaration of your passion, compel me to show myself more ungrateful. And if, of the love you bear me, you should find that there is anything else in my power wherein I can gratify you, provided it be not love itself, demand it of me. For I swear to you, by that sweet absent enemy of mine, to grant it this instant, though it be that you require of me a lock of Medusa's hair, which was all snakes, or even the very beams of the sun shut up in a vial. My mistress wants nothing of that sort, Sir Knight, said Mary Tornes at this. What, then, discreet dame, is it that your mistress wants? replied Don Quixote. Only one of your fair hands, said Maritones, to enable her to vent over it the great passion which has brought her to this loophole, so much to the risk of her honour, for if the lord her father had heard her, the last slice he would cut off would be her ear. I should like to see that tried, said Don Quixote, but he had better beware of that, if he does not want to meet the most disastrous end that ever father in the world met for having laid hands on the tender limbs of a love-stricken daughter. Maritornus felt sure that Don Quixote would present the hand she had asked, and making up her mind what to do, she got down from the hole and went into the stable, where she took the halter of Sancho Panza's ass, and in all haste returned to the hole, just as Don Quixote had planted himself, standing on Rothenanti's saddle, in order to reach the grated window where he supposed the lovelorn damsel to be, and giving her his hand, he said, "'Lady, take this hand, or rather, this scourge of the evildoers of the earth. Take, I say, this hand which no other hand of woman has ever touched, not even hers who has complete possession of my entire body. I present it to you, not that you may kiss it, but that you may observe the contexture of the sinews, the close network of the muscles, the breadth and capacity of the veins, and whence you may infer what must be the strength of the arm that has such a hand. That we shall see presently, said Maritones, and making a running knot on the halter, she passed it over his wrist, and coming down from the hole, tied the other end very firmly to the bolt of the door of the straw loft. Don Quixote, feeling the roughness of the rope on his wrist, exclaimed, "'Your grace seems to be grating rather than caressing my hand. "'Treat it not so harshly, "'for it is not to blame for the offence my resolution has given you. "'Nor is it just to wreck all your vengeance on so small a part. "'Remember that one who loves so well "'should not revenge herself so cruelly.' "'But there was nobody now to listen to these words of Don Quixote's. "'For as soon as Maritones had tied him, "'she and the other made off ready to die with laughing, leaving him fastened in such a way that it was impossible for him to release himself. He was, as has been said, standing on Rothenanti, with his arm passed through the hole and his wrist tied to the bolt of the door, and in mighty fear and dread of being left hanging by the arm if Rothanti were to stir one side or the other, so he did not dare to make the least movement. Although, from the patience, an imperturbable disposition of Rothenanti, he had good reason to expect that he would stand without budging for a whole century. Finding himself fast, then, 
and that the ladies had retired. He began to fancy that all this was done by enchantment, as on the former occasion when, in that same castle, that enchanted moor of a carrier had belaboured him, and he cursed in his heart his own want of sense and judgment in venturing to enter the castle again, after having come off so badly the first time, it being a settled point with knight-errants, that when they have tried an adventure and have not succeeded in it, it is a sign that it is not reserved for them but for others, and that therefore they need not try it again. Nevertheless he pulled his arm to see if it could release himself, but it had been made so fast that all his efforts were in vain. It is true he pulled it gently, lest Rothenanti should move, but, try as he might to seat himself in the saddle, he had nothing for it but to stand upright or pull his hand off. Then it was he wished for the sword of Amadis, against which no enchantment, whatever, had any power. Then he cursed his ill fortune. Then he magnified to the loss the world was sustained by his absence, while he remained there enchanted. For that, he believed, was beyond all doubt. Then he once more took to thinking of his beloved Dulcinea del Toboso. Then he called to his worthy squire, Sancho Panza, who, buried in sleep, and stretched upon the pack-saddle of his ass, was oblivious at that moment of the mother that bore him. Then he called upon the sages Logandio and Alquif to come to his aid. Then he invoked his good friend Aganda to succour him, and then, at last, morning found him in such a state of desperation and perplexity that he was bellowing like a bull, for he had no hope the day would bring any relief to his suffering, which he believed would last for ever, insomuch as he was enchanted. And of this he was convinced, by seeing that raw Thanante never stirred, much or little, and he felt persuaded that he and his horse were to remain in this state, without eating or drinking or sleeping, until the malign influence of the stars was overpassed, or until some other more sage enchanter should disenchant him. But he was very much deceived in this conclusion, for daylight had hardly begun to appear, when there came up to the inn four men on horseback, well equipped and accoutred, with firelocks across their saddle-bows. They called out and knocked loudly at the gate of the inn, which was still shut. On seeing which, Don Quixote, even there where he was, did not forget to act as sentinel, and said in a loud and imperious tone, Knights or squires, or whatever ye be, ye have no right to knock at the gates of this castle, for it is plain enough that they who are within are either asleep, or else are not in the habit of throwing open the fortress until the sun's rays are spread over the whole surface of the earth. Withdraw to a distance, and wait till it is broad daylight, and then we shall see whether it will be proper or not to open to you. "'What the devil fortress or castle is this?' said one. "'To make us stand on such ceremony? If you are the innkeeper, bid them open to us. We are travellers, who only want to feed our horses and go on, for we are in haste.' "'Do you think, gentlemen, that I look like an innkeeper?' said Don Quixote. "'I don't know what you look like,' replied the other. "'But I know that you are talking nonsense when you call this inn a castle.' "'A castle it is,' returned Don Quixote. "'Nay, more. One of the best in this whole province. "'And it has within it people who have had the sceptre in their hand and the crown on their head.' "'It would be better if it were the other way,' said the traveller the sceptre on the head, and the crown in the hand. But, if so, may be, there is within some company of players, with whom it is a common thing to have these crowns and sceptres you speak of, for in such a small inn as this, and where such silence is kept, I do not believe any people entitled to crowns and sceptres could have taken up their quarters. You know but little of the world, returned Don Quixote, since you are ignorant of what commonly occurs in knight errantry. But the comrades of the spokesman, growing weary of the dialogue with Don Quixote, renewed their knocks with great vehemence. So much so that the host, 
and not only he, but everybody in the inn, awoke, and he got up to ask who knocked. It happened at this moment that one of the horses of the four who were seeking admittance went to smell Roth and Ante, who, melancholy, dejected, and with drooping ears stood motionless, supporting his sorely stretched master. And as he was, after all flesh, though he looked as if he were made of wood, he could not help giving way, and in return smelling the one who had come to offer him attentions. But he had hardly moved at all, when Don Quixote lost his footing, and slipping off the saddle he would have come to the ground, but for being suspended by the arm, which caused him such agony that he believed either his wrist would be cut through, or his arm torn off, and he hung so near the ground that he could just touch it with his feet, which was all the worse for him, for, finding how little was wanted to enable him to plant his feet firmly, he struggled and stretched himself as much as he could to gain a footing, just like those who undergo the torture of the strapado, when they are fixed at touch and no touch, who aggravate their own sufferings by their violent efforts to stretch themselves, deceived by the hope which makes them fancy that with a very little more they will reach the ground. End of part 15 Chapters 42 and 43